Okay, welcome to Global Ed TV. This is the fourth uh, segment in our series, Foundational Attitudes and Projects for Global Citizenship. And it's brought to you by the Global Education Conference Network and Know My World. We're super excited to uh, have you with us as we've been scaffolding these projects to create a deeper understanding of what it means to be a global citizen uh, for students all over the world. And I just want to apologize a little bit if any of this introduction is a little redundant. Uh, we've been doing that to support people who have only been able to come in and out of the series. Uh, attendance always fluctuates with the live version due to time zones and other commitments. And this is a uh, recorded series, so sometimes people uh, will come in intermittently with uh, what they're viewing and uh, how they're applying. So we just want to make sure that everybody has the uh, same information as we start each one of these projects. So as I mentioned, this is brought to you by the Global Education Conference Network, a brilliant network of collaborative, inclusive, worldwide community members uh, involving students, educators, and organizations at all levels from all over the world. Uh, this network is designed to significantly increase the opportunities for connecting classrooms while supporting cultural awareness and recognition of diversity and educational access for all. So if you have not already, please join uh, the Global Education Conference Network. Register. Um, you'll be connected to over 20,000 participants, teachers, professionals, educators in the world. And uh, every year they have a great lineup of events um, and virtual conferences for you to attend, present, and increase your knowledge around global education. So really um, recommend that you join that network and share with your, with your colleagues. Also brought to you by Know My World, uh, and that is uh, Genevieve Murphy and myself are here uh, sharing this series with you. Uh, we are the co-founders of a global education uh, resource organization, and we support teachers in shared learning experiences through virtual exchange and also social, emotional, cultural, and academic projects. Um, and so this series is based on a series of projects that we've created to increase global citizenship in the classroom. So I just want to take a moment and invite our, uh, our live participants to mark on this map where you are in the world so we can see our different representations. Um, and if you don't know already, you can click this little sun. Somebody's already do it, already done it. Great. So the, uh, on the left-hand toolbar where you'll see the chat menu, you're just going to click on that sun. And then you are going to drop it over the area of the world that you're in. So just click it right on there. Awesome. I think, it, uh, is that New York or uh, uh, Virginia? Somebody on the east coast of the U.S.? We've got somebody way up there. Is that Maine or Canada? Uh, we got New York. Perfect. New York. Uh, we've got Arizona, Phoenix, people in, in Phoenix, uh, myself in Mexico, uh, Toronto. Awesome. Genevieve, are you able to mark on the map as well? I was trying to, but somehow my son has to But I'm in Taiwan. Okay. <laughs> Genevieve is in Taiwan, so uh, awesome. Okay, so we've got a, definitely a multicultural outfit here for sure. <laughs> so that's great. Thank you, everyone, for, for marking that on the map. Okay, so just briefly introduce myself. My name is Lisa Petro. Again, I'm the co-founder of Know My World. Um, I am also a curriculum development consultant, and I specialize in social and emotional learning, cultural competency, and global ed. Um, and so I um, graciously bring you this series uh, over the course of this semester to support uh, you and your students and your learning communities in uh, developing a deeper understanding and efficacy as a global citizen. And this series itself has been created so that we can focus on the kinds of social and emotional foundations that are necessary for the development of global citizens. So I, I've mentioned before in other series, it's important that we have a variety of competencies 
inside of being global citizens. Uh, of course, a big part of that is knowledge, having information and accurate knowledge about the world and the cultures of the world and uh, the kinds of skills that we would use to collaborate and cooperate and interact uh, with people from lots of different backgrounds. Um, of course, language is a huge part, being able to communicate clearly, both verbally and non-verbally with people, um, and the way we engage with the world. And then at the foundation of that is our attitudes um, and the way that we perceive the world, the way we approach the world, uh, the feelings and emotions um, that we carry about ourselves and others. And so we really wanted to offer a series for teachers to support students in digging deeper into those kinds of social and emotional skills um, and awarenesses that would support them in interacting with the world more fluidly and authentically. And so we share with you a link here to one of our reports. Uh, as I mentioned, these five uh, projects are from a large curriculum that Know My World um, has put into effect. And we wanted to offer you an internal report that we've done to look at the qualitative impact of these projects. Um, so you can find that report here um, in this link to read um, and, and look at the assessment. So here we are. Uh, we are at the fourth project of this five-part series. And we're going to be looking at communication today. For those of you that have been able to follow the series so far, um, you can see that we're at that point where students have been digging deeply about various issues. And at this point, we're focusing on relationships. So the relationship not only with ourselves, but the relationships that we have with others. And we're looking at four key indicators in terms of assessing the efficacy of this work. Um, the first part is self-awareness, so supporting students in discovering a knowledge of who they are and how they react to the world using critical thought. There's also openness, uh, supporting students in developing a willingness to accept diverse people and backgrounds in such a way that invites a multiple series of perspectives um, and gives them that kind of flexibility in their thinking. Also sensitivity, so being aware of the needs and responses of others and managing our responses and our beliefs in the way that it impacts our ability to build relationships with others. And then lastly, adaptability. So are students able to shift their behaviors and participate in dualistic thinking in order to co-construct power sharing in those re relationships and contexts that they're engaging in? And we provide for you in all of our lesson sequences, and uh, we also gauge our projects based on this rubric, so taking those four competency areas and looking at a developmental process from a limited ability to exercise each of these areas uh, to moderate and then, of course, advanced. So we share this with you for your use also when uh, assessing your students. And a reminder that all of our projects are based on Kolb's model of experiential learning. So the idea here is that as human beings, we have concrete experiences. That's something that will happen with or without the awareness. But through those concrete experiences, um, there are certain parts, certain levels, certain contexts that we will naturally reflect and observe on. And of course, with the more skill and critical thought, we'll have more access to those observations. But regardless, we will have these reflections. And those reflections will lead us to an abstract conceptualization about what we've experienced. What does that mean? And that gives us new information to go out into the world and actively experiment with what we think we know and what we've experienced. And so it's a cycle. From that experimentation, now we have a new body of knowledge that can feed and supply and create foundational uh, experience going forward. And so this process happens over and over again, and it's a way in which we can learn, make meaning, and make sense out of our human experiences, our cultural experiences. Uh, and so all of our projects are designed to lead students uh, with that kind of experiential pathway. What are they experiencing in their daily lives, not just in the classroom? What does this mean? What, what does this information say? How can they turn these concepts into new areas of learning and new experiences. And the kinds of evidences that we produce and that you'll see it, uh, documented in this series um, cover all the four primary areas. It's important when talking about global citizenship, when talking about global competence, 
take into consideration the whole person. So we'll be looking at qualitative evidence, most typically through journal reflections, expressive arts. In this particular project today, we're looking at role-playing performances. Uh, we'll look at formative uh, kinds of evidences, so interviews in this particular um, project. The quantitative, um, I forgot to circle this, but surveys is going to be a part of this, so we're going to share with you a little bit of some of our survey responses. And then lastly, the summative, which is the um, entire process. So looking at uh, the assessment of the expected learning outcomes, doing some review, and of course, the rubric evaluation for the projects in the series. So I just want to take a moment to introduce our global educator uh, who is featuring these projects in her classroom currently as we go through. So just know that we are doing this lot with you uh, live, all of these projects are being featured to you only a few weeks after their completion. So this is fresh and this is happening now. Um, so Genevieve, without further ado, please, if you would like to talk a little about yourself. Hi, uh, everybody, and thank you um, once again for joining us in the series. And uh, as Lisa mentioned, my name is Genevieve Messi, and I currently live and teach in Taiwan, in Taichung, Taiwan. I work at an international school here called American School at Taichung. And I've been in Taiwan for about six years. And so the projects that we are seeing are featured in my classroom. And we use Know My World model, our CCAL model, in a lot of our project development and our programs. So we focus a lot on social and emotional as well as cultural and academic learning in all of our projects and programs that we develop. And I think it's a good way to really make sure that students are getting a quote-unquote well-rounded education so that it's not only emphasizing and focusing on the academic aspects, but also on how to be um, a contributing member of society and culturally aware and empathetic or respect, um, able to respect other people from other cultures and other parts of the world as well. And also being able to tap into their own uh, awareness of self through their emotional understandings and interpretations as well. And this is my school. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, campus located in the foothills of Dokken in the mountains of Taiwan. So we're located outside of the city, which is nice, a nice break from the business of, uh, of the city. Uh, it's like grades 1 through 12 school. And we incorporate these aspects of uh, standards, both Washington State standards and Common Core standards. And we are transitioning into using next-gen science standards. Uh, we are accredited by the WASC Association. And we also implement ESSERS, which are expected school-wide learning results. And a lot of the programs and projects that we incorporate from Know My World actually help to reinforce these extra skills um, as well. And, and these are my students. <laughs> so I have 11 students from five different countries. And we do a lot in the classroom to just uh, help teach and learn and grow together about cultural awareness and self-awareness. And it's really been wonderful now as the school years wrapping up to be able to see their growth and development both personally and in the relationships that they've created with each other uh, throughout the year. So um, they're wonderful kids, and I'm really excited that I'm able to teach them this year. Thanks, Genevieve. So as you've seen, these 11 students that Genevieve is working with is third grade, and, and uh, our Know My World classroom typically takes place in an elementary school classroom. But if you were able to join us the last series, we often incorporate other 
grade levels into that learning. So we do a lot of interdisciplinary learning and a lot of uh, gener multi-generational learning as well. And we're fortunate enough in our partnership with American School Tai Chung to have the Know My World classroom. Um, so although these projects are being in implemented year-round in that particular grade level, uh, again, we have, a, we have a lot of visitors and um, collaborators from the different uh, grades. And uh, for the last session that we had, we invited in the AV club from the high school to work on documenting some of the social, emotional, and cultural learning uh, for the students. So uh, that's a reminder for those of you that are not necessarily um, teaching elementary school that these, uh, these projects can be modified. We offer you some basic modifications at the end of the session. Um, but if you're interested in, in really um, getting some extra support around that, we do have materials that are for uh, different grade levels, so we can share that with you, too. You can just contact us. Okay, so a little bit of background about what we're going to be talking about today. Um, as I mentioned, we provide scaffolding in our learning. We look for ways that we can bring students from the foundations of awareness as that key access point and work them into the more complex structures of what it means to interact with self in the world. Um, and so just to point out this journey we've sort of been on together, in February we began with identity. And that's a huge piece. Um, and that's something that doesn't necessarily ha um, have to be in one developmental uh, age level. I mean, identity can be revisited over and over and over again in our lives. Whenever I, I do professional development trainings with, with, with schools, I talk to teachers about learning actually happening in more of a vortex than a staircase. Inside of that vortex, uh, there are different areas of learning that are repeating themselves over and over and over again as they go up that tunnel, that tornado tunnel. And so um, identity is a key area to begin especially when you're working in grade levels and you have the beginning of a school year and you have a new cohort of students working together and supporting them and questioning uh, who they are, how they fit into this group, how do they belong, what do they bring and contribute. So in that first session, we started with identity and we helped students to lay a found foundation for cultural awareness. Who am I? What do I bring to this classroom? Uh, my life is extended beyond these four walls. I have a family. I have a neighborhood. I have a, a country. I, I, there's all these different areas I belong to. You know, what does that mean? So we, we support them in the tools to, with the tools to bring that in. In the second uh, segment of the series, we looked at subjectivity and supporting students in growing their perspectives. And we looked at some really interesting research about the developmental process of critical thought the psychology of critical thought. And so in this, we supported them to look at a variety of perspectives and, and look at, um, depending on people's backgrounds, depending on the information that we learn from our communities, depends on how we see the world, our, our, our global mindset or our cultural worldview. And then in the third part, we moved into labeling and we looked, took a deeper look at how our identity and how our ability to view the world can actually support us in labeling and positioning others and coming up with opinions and assumptions about who we are and who other people are and what that means. So we walk students through that kind of self-reflection and also bring them out into the relationship to see the impact that can have on, their, uh, on, on others. And so today, it's uh, natural that we start walking into communication. Now we have this information. We know some bits about who we are. We understand that perspective is relative and can be subjective. And we see that those perspectives can create assumptions and labels about the world. So what do we do with that? How do we consciously uh, communicate and effectively communicate uh, with, with others? especially in the face of these kinds of cultural differences. And so I just want to bring you back um, to a little bit of that assessment piece. And so something we were able to do is kind of use this as a midpoint between the five projects in the series to start gauging the climate of the students. Where are they with this learning? Are they getting these concepts? Are they going deeper with the scaffolding of the learning? And so we did three things. Genevieve had a class discussion with her students, a guided discussion. 
she issued them a survey or a questionnaire to complete and also had a look at the rubrics to kind of see if there was any process or a progress in the development. So we asked this set of questions to the students and each set was focused on the previous three projects we've done. So the first one around identity was of course about awareness. The second one was about perspective. The third one about labeling. In the awareness piece, we wanted to know, um, did they get the, the, the lesson? Did they get the, the uh, impact of that? So why is it important that we know about other people's cultures? Do they, still know, do they still remember that and hang on to that and synthesize that three months after that initial lesson? And then we asked them for a qualitative example. We want to see our students relating this still in their lives. And then the same thing with perspective and labeling. You know, why is this important? And what kind of concrete experience can you give us that you're still relating these, uh, these teachings in your daily life? So the results were quite interesting. Um, and so what we found from these survey responses it was that 100% of the students were able to state the learning outcome clearly. They knew exactly why it was important to identify culture. Uh, and they had no problems making those kinds of statements. 90% of them were able to share a related experience. Culture is important because it helps you understand the world. And I met someone recently who uh, thought this way about the world and that made me feel proud of my culture, right? So they were able to give you that kind of experience. Where we saw the numbers drop was interesting. 54, so slightly more than half of the class, were able to explain that experience adequately. They could name an experience related to that particular segment, but they had a hard time finding the vocabulary to really clearly make a declaration of what that meant to them. And slightly more than half of the students were also able to meet all three of the assessment indicators, meaning they could state the learning outcome, they could share an experience that was relevant, and they could explain clearly the experience by identifying their own and others' feelings involved in the experience. So this is quite perfect because where it leads us is to communication. Students are able to have the awareness but what they're lacking in is the vocabulary and the ability to communicate clearly. And so perfectly we move into that. And the competency areas we're looking at in this project, conscious communication, choosing words, is self-management. So their ability to not just be aware of their feelings, but manage those feelings. And how that in turn creates skills for participating in relationships actively and effectively. And then in cultural competence, their ability to communicate across cultures to have this intercultural dialogue despite the cultural differences. So the expected learning outcomes for this are very clear uh, regarding the materials as well that we're looking to uh, use to support this teaching. Number one, we want students to identify their emotional reactions and the impact, and we're going to use a case study called Nail on the Fence. It's a story to help them reflect on behaviors of characters. So at first, taking it a little bit about outside of themselves. Also, that they recognize and name their own emotional responses through partner dialogue and journaling. It's important that they can do this in conversation, not just in isolation. Um, that they'll also have an understanding of the kinds of words and phrases that support effective verbal communication, and that it creates an appropriate dialogue. And then lastly, that they can demonstrate these two very important key words, ownership and accountability for their words and actions when communicating with others. And they do that through reflection on behavior and then also a collaboration to create outcomes. This is important. So these are the four expected learning outcomes uh, that we've set for this project with students. Uh, this does, does, of course, touch on standards. We've just given you a taste. Uh, for the Common Core, Conventions of Standard English, Washington State Standards, um, Component 3.1, Expressing Feelings, and then of course um, being able to create works of theater that present ideas and express feelings. 
Okay, so here's the big question in the research. Why create conscious communication? How do we, have, did we develop this project? So the first thing we sort of looked at is what is personal responsibility? This is a hot topic in classrooms all over the world. We want students to take responsibility for their education, for the things that they say, even material items, taking care of their belongings. So what is personal responsibility and how do we help students to understand these you know, kind of foreign concepts of ownership and accountability. And so the first thing is looking for a way to define that. Now there's actually a lot of definitions. This field of study in personal responsibility or self-directed learning even is pretty uh, old. It's been around for quite a while. I think formal definitions you can find for about 50 years. Um, it's most typically seen in uh, research for um, social behavioral studies, social constructivism, these kinds of things. We've decided on uh, using this particular definition by Amanda Mergler um, from Queensland University, um, in which she says, personal responsibility is our ability to regulate one's own thoughts, feelings, and behavior, along with a willingness to hold oneself accountable for the choices made and the social and personal outcomes generated. Uh, so the idea here, and, and what I like about her, her theory, she also partnered, and I've given you this resource in the work cited, uh, with another educator, Paul Shields from Queensland University, and they developed the personal responsibility scale. It's pretty recent, from 2016. And they created a psychometric survey with 34 items that, child, that students can take uh, to, to sort of gauge what is their level of personal responsibility. It asks questions like, um, I can choose how I behave, or I want my actions to help others, right? And it's, and it's, and it's rated on this scale. Um, and it's pretty powerful stuff, especially when you consider that the idea of personal responsibility can also be dependent on cultural context. For example, in the U.S., we might say that personal responsibility is being the master of our own life, of our potential, of meeting our goals and our dreams. Where in uh, Eastern culture, it might be more of a responsibility for others' happiness and the ways in which our communities function. Um, so there can be some distinctions. And so this particular um, uh, definition really sort of engulfs all of these different uh, perspectives. So it's very interesting. And how does personal responsibility impact this idea of conscious communication? Well. Inside of interpersonal dynamics and conflicts, so talking about maybe some of those social and cultural challenges that we face, those differences, there's a path of study, and this was taken by uh, researchers Drew and uh, Nippenberg, did a very interesting study about conflict ownership. And the idea is that, if you remember from our last segment, we talked about Vygotsky and the cycle of self-perception and how we position others. Sue Rafi's theory of conceptualizing the other. We have this perception of ourself, and from that perception, from that worldview, we position other people. We say where they belong, what they're supposed to do, what they're supposed to say. We can stereotype them. That's definitely part of positioning others. And what happens is we develop this personal value system. We develop this world in which things are supposed to be just so. And so if someone comes along and challenges that personal value system, well, there becomes a sense of ownership over what we believe, what we know is right, what we know is good, right? And that is highly subjective. So this ownership of our value system can create an emotional response, this fight or flight, right, this defend or avoid. And that can lead into the way that we interact in conflict in cultural differences and social differences. And so this is a really important study because it talks about a variety of emotional coping mechanisms that can come out of ownership. It's not enough just to have personal responsibility and ownership because that is subjective, what we're owning. Going beyond that is accountability. And this is why it's important for students to understand that. So when we talk about developing strategies for personal responsibility and relationship skills, particularly with young students, particularly with classroom, people, researchers inside of social and emotional learning tend to look at cognitive behavioral theory, crit thinking critically, 
about our emotions, thinking critically about our reactions. Why did we react that way? Why do we feel that way? What is this rooted in? Not only culturally, but just our, in general, our, our experiences. And our thoughts having that impact on our feelings and making those connections so that we can look at different perspectives and we can potentially shift those behaviors. And so that's the idea of the cognitive triangle, is that our thoughts impact our feelings, our feelings impact our behaviors. In effect, if we can look at the source of those thoughts and our feelings, then we can own them and be accountable for the impact and shift that inside of a cultural behavioral, uh, cognitive behavioral theory. So what that looks like, and, and this uh, quote I've taken from uh, a, a great uh, researcher, Mark Brackett, um, who is co-creator of Ruler from Yale, something great you, you could potentially look at using in your classroom, uh, the Ruler program, the Mood Meter. I've given you links as well in the works cited. Um, and the idea here is that what students need is the ability to accurately label those emotions and experiences, the vocabulary to go forward and communicate it. Without that vocabulary, without that labeling, it becomes very difficult to name it and shift the behavior. So the process that we walk our students through is number one, identifying the emotions. What am I feeling? Number two, regulating the emotions, that self-management. What is the impact of my emotion on myself and on others? And then the last step, communicating clearly. What words and actions can I make to communicate my needs and the needs of others in an emotionally responsible way? And so a good example of this is anger, right? We can see that gauge. We can envision that gauge there. Okay, I've talked enough. I think now we can turn this over to Genevieve to support, uh, to, to share with you and support you in um, what that looks like in the classroom and, and the impact that we've got with our uh, Know My World students. Okay. Jennifer. Great. Um, thank you so much uh, once again. And yes, so Bill, uh, I guess, now sharing examples of all of the research that Lisa has just explained and shared with us, um, which is all very impacting and um, profound and important for uh, our students to also be aware of and know about. So um, we always begin with explaining um, preparation and the importance of creating the climate in your classroom that you want to create that is open and respectful and allow students the freedom and confidence to be able to talk and share about their ideas. And so this is a short checklist of ways in which you as educators can choose to create that space with your students. So one thing that I uh, talk about and reiterate and reinforce over and over and over again, pretty much all year long, uh, is active listening skills, especially with lower elementary students, because they're just full of energy and excitement. We just want to tell you everything right now, all the time. And so they don't really have that innate listening coping mechanism of just like, oh, <laughs> let me see if someone else is talking first before I jump in and contribute what I want to say. And so it's just a constant reminder and reiteration of you know, stop, look, listen, and then raise your hand if you want to share something or make sure that you're not talking over someone if they're already talking. Um, make eye contact when others are speaking so that they know that you're listening, nod your head or something, some kind of response signal so that they know that you're understanding what they're saying and things like that. And so um, these are skills that you can start kind of integrating into your classroom, even with lower elementary students. And of course, continuing through all grade levels, um, through college <laughs> level students too. Um, it can't hurt to have that reminder of the value of active listening and the expectations of what that means. And then also an, another reiteration of just being respectful uh, to other people's ideas and contributions. And this is really important if you want to create a climate of student contributions in classroom discussions. 
um, everything that they say, put it on the board. Um, or help them kind of reword it or re-understand it if it isn't exactly uh, right on point, but still acknowledge it through positive um, uh, comments and um, just, yeah, allowing them to really feel what they're saying and contributing is important. <clears throat> and uh, again, reiterating uniqueness and differences, students, uh, learn throughout the year that we're all different, especially when we have students from different cultural or ethnic backgrounds. Um, so learning or teaching students how to value that difference and appreciate those differences um, is important. And positive language and affirmation uh, are, again, very important. And having them in a classroom discussions where you're leading them with open-ended questions and having them contribute their thoughts uh, is really, really valuable. And something that I've learned uh, as an educator is that this is where authentic learning occurs. This is where students really feel ownership in their learning process is because you're not telling them what they need to know. You're giving them a platform and a space for them to generate their own thoughts and their own awareness. And we all know that we learn by doing, not from being told what to do. And so dynamic classroom discussions with open-ended questions is really a great um, way to do this. And it can be done daily with just as an opening um, to any lesson, uh, or it could be done through journal reflections, and then you can choose to share. or. You know, there's different ways that you can do it, but definitely giving students a platform to find and share their voice is important. So ownership and accountability. So these are big words for third grade, but um, like anything, it's all about how you present it and share it. And if you have an expectation that they'll be able to understand it, then they will be able to. So it's basically just taking big words and breaking it down to smaller words to helping them understand what it what they mean. So before we began this lesson, uh, this was our introduction activity. And I really love this activity because you can see from the pictures that they really love this activity. So anything that gets the students actively engaged is definitely a great way to start in the lesson. And so basically, you give the students, uh, have them work in pairs, but can be small groups or individuals, um, a tube of toothpaste, and tell them to squeeze out all of the toothpaste. And as you can see, they really enjoy doing that. Um, and you don't really tell them anything else besides that. You just give them the toothpaste and tell them to squeeze it out. And so they do that. Then, when they're done, you tell them to put the toothpaste back in the tube. And uh, I was really fortunate to capture this picture. Uh, this is I was just in that direction. Um, and this is pretty much the reaction from all the students. It's kind of like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, and so they get that this is now going to be a challenge. And that's the entire point of, of this exercise. Um, so they get very creative with uh, how they try to put the toothpaste back in, and they find all kinds of tools, pencils or scissors or rulers or their fingers or their hands, um, and they work really hard to get it in, but as you can see, it winds up in more of their hands, and uh, a little bit they can get back in, but they cannot get all of the toothpaste back in to the toothpaste to looking exactly the way it did when they first got it. Um, and so, uh, again, it's just like a fun activity to get them to think about um, communication and, and our words. And so I asked them, I'm like, so what do you think this, this has to do with communication? Um, and uh, and they're able to kind of uh, share their ideas and their thoughts, and they're able to get basically that it's really easy to 
squeeze the toothpaste out. And it, it doesn't really take a whole lot of thought um, to get the toothpaste out. And so, of course, the two represent us speaking and the toothpaste represents our legs. Um, but taking words back is really difficult and challenging and quite messy. And so there's um, a bigger mess that we need to clean up with uh, when you're trying to take words back. And then that leads us to this uh, case study story of the men on the fence. And some of you might be aware of this um, story, but it's a really, it's a short story, but it's a great way to help students once again understand the concept of being aware of um, reaction versus response and our words and the impact that our words and actions have um, on people. And so basically, uh, a short summary is there's a little boy and he gets angry easily and so his dad tells him to, every time he gets he feels angry, go take a nail and drive it into the fence. And so like the first day he drives 37 nails into the fence. And um, slowly over time he realizes how much energy and time and how hard it is to drive all these nails into the fence. And so he finds other ways to manage his anger uh, emotions. And slowly over time, he doesn't feel the need to drive any nails into the fence. And so he goes and he tells his dad, oh, I don't, uh, it's been a long time since I've had to drive a nail into the fence, and I feel much better, and things like that. And so his dad says, that's great, that's excellent. So now, for every day that you feel that you don't, you know, that you're able to manage your emotions and control those that anger, take a nail out of the fence. And so a uh, long period of time goes by, and each day he takes one nail out of the fence, and finally after the last nail, he goes back and tells his dad, I've taken all the nails out. So then his dad takes him to go look at the fence, and he sees that even though the nails are gone, the hole is still in, in the wood. And so, again, it's another metaphor of the impact that we have, and even though if, if we're angry and we do something out of... Um, as a reaction and not really thinking about what we say or do before we do it, mm -hmm. we're going to leave a scar on the person who we impacted. And no matter how many times we apologize, there's still going to be some semblance of a scar in me. Um, and so it's just a lot better to think before you act and before you speak um, to prevent hurting others unnecessarily. And so we begin uh, after these two kind of warm-up activities with the classroom discussion, um, again, uh, with this focus of ownership. And so they uh, were able to realize that there were two words in, in ownership. And so at first they recognized owner as something um, that we own. So they used pets as the initial thought process. Um, and then understanding that you need to take care of something that you own. Um, and finally realizing that something, ownership is something that belongs to you. And so I asked them, does it have to be a thing that you own? You know, what are some other things that you can own? And they immediately got it. They were like, oh, that works. What we say, what we do, how we treat other people. Um, and we were able to just kind of share a flood of their own thoughts and ideas um, around us. And so it was really great to see that already they, they were able to get it and understand um, the value of this concept of ownership around their words and, and also uh, in their actions. And so I asked them to create a list of ownership words. And so the uh, we covered the entire board of things that they could say. So, again, touching on different emotions. So I asked them, like, why, uh, what are some things that you can say to others? And so first they said, like, good job, great, excellent. Um, and then I said, but what if you're feeling frustrated? Or what if you're feeling angry? Or what if you're feeling sad? Or what if someone's doing something that you don't like? How can you respond to them? And so um, they were able to really kind of expand that thought process in different areas of, of their life and ways that they can 
uh, kind of create an arsenal of words to choose from in various situations depending on their emotional state of being in that moment. Um, so uh, it was really, again, another really phenomenal uh, class discussion. And these are all generated by third grade minds, so it's great to see their, their ownership in this discussion. And then we expanded the conversation um, the next day to accountability. And what does that mean? And so they were able to find the word count and, uh, in, the, in the word. <laughs> and so first, of course, they said counting one, two, three. Um, but then they said, what about count on? What does that mean? And so then they were able to really um, reprocess that word as a different way as far as like things that you are responsible for or uh, words that you say and, and uh, following through with those words and responses or those actions. Um, so this is a list of people who they can feel that they can count on in the blue and then in the red is ways that they are accountable. And there's a good acronym called WATCH uh, where they are um, accountable for their words, their actions, their thoughts, their companions, and their habits. And we went through an uh, in-depth conversation about each of those and, and the segment as well. Um, and then again, just helping them to really be aware of the fact that they need to be accountable um, for their words and what they say and keeping their promises um, and being aware of their word choice before they statements. So then they use this template of way uh, to kind of identify specific words and phrases that they like from our, the board uh, and made this worksheet where they wrote down how things that they could say um, and uh, in different situations. And then from there they made a word collage. So again, just reiterating this concept of ownership of words and having a, a pool of words and phrases that they can use in different situations. Um, so when they're in that situation, they, they can think, oh, what can, what can I say? Instead of getting mad, what can I say? Instead of having the thing, um, and things like that. So uh, really great activity, and I really enjoyed it. So they used magazines and cut out some pictures where they just wrote their own words. Um, they choose um, but you can also do something like a wordle in this activity or a poem or um, a graphic poem or something like that. Okay. And then they did some role playing. And in elementary school, role playing is still a lot of fun and we enjoy it. Um, and so I uh, try and use role playing scenarios as much as possible because, again, it gives them kind of practice in real life situations. <laughs> and uh, so these are a couple of examples. So which <laughs> the first one was actually quite funny because I had two students partnered together and um, and we have three girls and they try and they really enjoy working together most of the time. But occasionally I make them work with a boy partner. And so this is one of those situations. And so I had one partner a boy and a girl student, and she, the girl was uh, very uh, noticeably not thrilled about this partner that she was working with, and which is ironic because I was like, this is all about communication and thinking before you speak and thinking about your actions and your words, and so we were able to immediately apply this whole teaching lesson into this real life scenario. And so I gave them one scenario card. And um, and they were like, this one's too hard, this one's too hard. And so I flipped through, and then I found this other one uh, that 
this first example that I shared here where you have to work with a partner and you don't know who that person you're partnered with, uh, so how do you feel on how do you react? And so, um, and then she just looked at me with, like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I kind of took a look and I said, have fun. <laughs> and so, uh, it was really excellent because it was immediate application for the thing that we, uh, were, um, just talking about and learning about. Um, so these are a few of the, um, a couple of examples of the scenarios. And then they went into um, role playing mode and so they um, acted out these different examples. But first they identified the emotion that they would be feeling in the situation. Um, and then they kind of acted out uh, according to how they would want someone to respond or want, you know, what would be the appropriate response in this situation. So again, they had quite a lot of fun uh, with it. Um, so students were able to uh, contribute several ideas to the concept of ownership during the classroom discussions, as you can see from the pictures of the whiteboard. And um, they, started applying it to themselves and just kind of like, um, you know, how you have like the specific students you like to be kind of the class monitors and checking on things and making sure <laughs> that things are, uh, everyone's doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so a few of those students came back and said, we reminded so-and-so that they needed to think before they spoke and, and things like that. So um, they were kind of monitoring themselves in that regard. And uh, they had a very clear understanding of ownership and, and what that means. Um, and they were able to resolve problems. So this um, is really a handy tool, I guess, uh, for teachers when they're trying to uh, resolve classroom scuffles or bickering and things like that. And really just a lot of times, again, going back to that image of like a kid's fault, a child's fault, a kid's fault. Um, is helping them really turn the, the scope inwards and saying, but what are you responsible for? What did you say? What did you do? How did your actions impact the other person? Um, and helping them really realize that they were a part of that and that they had a responsibility in that situation and that that's what they're responsible for, apologizing for or rectifying in some way. Um, so it's a really good skill for classroom management. And um, and then again, do they just have like a list of words and phrases that they can use um, in real life situations that they can talk with and pull from. And these are a few rubrics, uh, rubric examples. Um, so you can see that the students are definitely um, getting more advanced um, in their awareness and their understanding. And so I just wanted to share this last um, anecdote and then um, uh, basically as part of our, our processing discussion towards the end, um, I asked the students um, to open up and share a little bit about their hurt feelings from the past or any anything, actually the, the discussion just kind of went into that direction. Um, so just talking about ownership and accountability and so this one student shared um, about uh, their feelings being hurt um, in the past. And then uh, there were two students in particular and they had both been at a different school together um, when they were in second grade um, or when they were in first grade. And then one student came at the beginning of second grade and then the second student came kind of in the middle of the second grade. And uh, so they were, but when the second student came, the first student kind of ignored him and didn't really um, reach out to him or try to be his friend or anything. And so the second student had a lot of behavior problems uh, when he first came to our school. And um, they've been, we worked with him and they've been ironed out. But in that discussion uh, that we had that day, he was able to say, I felt really, when I first came to um, AST, I was really confused about why that student, the first student, uh, wasn't being my friend and didn't want to hang out with me. And then 
uh, I said, well, how did that make you feel? And he said, it hurt my feelings. And I felt really sad about that. And then the first student was able to clarify and explain, like, why she had made that choice. And she was like, because when we were at the other school, we were really wild. And so then the first, the other student was like, oh, okay, I see and I understand. And they were able to really clear up something that had happened and that was like a, a I don't know, definitely something that was uh, affecting both of their, their relationships and their friendship with each other. Um, and they were able to like, clear it and process it and move on from it. And since then, they have been inseparable. <laughs> and so they really, um, it was beautiful to see them clear and, and clean up something that had, had they had both been kind of holding on to and had been impacting um, their friendship for about a year at that point. Um, so that's why these kinds of conversations are definitely meaningful. And then I even got an email from the cooking specialist that <laughs> normally the emails are, you know, this person had a hard time focusing or this person wasn't really paying attention, but um, it was the first email that she sent was like, these kids are superstars today. <laughs> they did an excellent job. So it was really nice to um, see uh, that response um, from them and the fact that you know, the whole day was kind of a much better day because of it. Um, and then here are a few examples of modifications uh, that you can uh, choose to use uh, with your students, especially if they're in older grade levels. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's basically the, the gist of the project. And there was a question as far as, um, I believe, the amount of time spent on separation. Um, so it's, uh, um, the toothpaste activity was one day, and then the nail on the fence story was just like the intro to the next day. So it doesn't take too much time. Um, you could do both of those actually in one class period, um, to be honest. So you don't need a whole lot of preparation time. And then WATCH was just the acronym uh, for um, things that students can be accountable for um, or aware of. So it's just something to help them remember, like I need to watch my words and my actions and my thoughts, and my companions, so being careful like what choices, what peers you pick and the choices that you make with things to do with them. And then your habits, like, you know, have things that you're doing on a regular basis. Um, so hopefully I've been able to answer questions, um, but if you have any others, please feel free to type them uh, in, uh, into the chat, and I'll continue to answer them as Lisa helps us wrap up the rest of the session. That's great. Genevieve, it looks like Peggy just posted another question. Would you have the students create short videos to demonstrate the different roles in, in terms of that role playing? Yes, absolutely. So you could do, um, you could have it be like one option uh, with a negative response and then one option with a positive response. Um, so yes, you could, uh, if you've got older students especially making videos, um, even short videos on their phone, like they really love any kind of use of technology in the classroom. So, uh, yeah, and then that way they could see, like, oh, this is one option that we have, but look at the impact that that has if we have a negative response. Versus if we have a positive response, we can all be happy with that and things like that. So, I think having those scenarios, having students act out those scenarios really gives them, um, even, with, especially with older students, um, in, uh, more clarity around um, the options of a response and the, the impact that it has on others. So definitely. Yeah, and Makeda just added that it uh, could be powerful to have students explore emotional literacy. Different responses have different impacts on emotions, and that's true. That the ability to really uh, look at those different impacts and see it, you know, like play back, actually play back their behavior and their choices. That's a really good point, Nikita. Awesome. Okay, well, unfortunately, we are running out of time here. Um, so just to wrap some things up, uh, as you can see, we've provided you the lesson plan PDF so that you can certainly use this and modify this uh, to the needs of your classroom. Um, this link, uh, which I'm going to post for you, 
in the chat box right now. Uh, this is full of all of the work cited from the resources, any image links, the cartoons, um, also links to reports, links to the lesson plan, um, or any um, other supporting resources that we've mentioned. So everything is there for you in one place to use. And uh, I know that we have questions here, but I think we already answered a couple of questions. So for the sake of time, unless there's anything burning, put it in the chat box. Um, but for the sake of time. We just want to, that's great. Thank you, Peggy. I think everything's been answered there. And um, we just want to remind you that our last segment in this series will be June 12th. And we're going to look at needs and wants and how taking this vocabulary and this level of communication and applying it to developing relationships and service learning um, can be impacting and beneficial for students to really understand the um, completion of, of what we've tried to teach them in this five-part series. And I think this is especially interesting for those of you that have um, colleagues that teach in elementary school. There's not a lot out there about service learning in elementary school. A lot of that work actually reflects charity based operations, which is also very important and necessary in the world. But we're going to actually look at building relationships across generations in service learning. So this could be a really interesting segment. Um, and a reminder, upcoming Global Education Conference events, they're at ISTE for Global Education Day, Sunday, June 25th. If you're in San Antonio, please look into participating and attending. Also, the Global Education Fair will be coming up in the fall. So please check out that link and look for ways that you can contribute. And of course, just following them on Twitter and social media and joining the network for any additional updates. So I want to thank you. This session is recorded. Um, we'll be sending out that link to all of you who have registered uh, tomorrow or the day after once it's formatted. And uh, thank you so much for your attendance, your participation, your questions, your insights, your ideas. Um, and everyone have a great evening, afternoon, or morning wherever you are in the world. Uh, thank you so much.